Um, welcome everyone to the um, July 26th school committee of Hadley Public Schools. Um, do I have a motion to uh, open? So moved. Second. I hear a second. Okay. okay, terrific. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, terrific. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We are going to um, first look at adjustments to the agenda. Annie? Yes, uh, let me just pull this up so I can see it for you. One, I just wanna let you know that um, I believe Ethan is not going to be joining us today. I just wanted to clarify, I think that he had a conflict today. I believe this is the meeting that he had a conflict for. Our adjustments to the agenda is that um, we will need to vote to accept a donation from Staples. I'll be presenting that to you. Uh, Chris will be asking the school committee to vote to dispose of assets that we're no longer using. We will not have executive session at the end of the meeting. So we'll just have a regular meeting and conclude. And Humera, I believe you had something also. Yes, we um, are um, going to make an adjustment to public comment. Our um, typical policy is to limit um, public comment to three minutes. That policy is not going to change, but for uh, as a one-time deal, we are going to um, allow um, an extended comment um, due to uh, reopening discussions uh, around this fall. Um, there are many impassioned um, viewpoints around, uh, around reopening, around masks, around vaccination. And so we're going to extend the time allotted only for this meeting. Um, and I am looking to see how many people that could potentially apply to not too many. So I'm thinking that uh, we're looking at about six minutes per, uh, per person. Great, so if you have a, um, if you're interested in making open comment, just go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will take you off mute um, so that you can speak. And um, I see um, Sarah Pegas is, um, I'm going to uh, unmute you, Sarah. All right, great. Sarah, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I, I have a few things to say. I don't know if I'll take up six minutes, but we'll see, I suppose. Um, I have an incoming second grader um, who has been home since last March um, with us. He has an underlying health condition, so we've been trying to protect him as much as possible. Um, and I, my concern is specifically the DESI announcement that masks would not be required or social distancing. Um, my son gets a common cold and I'm at Bay State. Like his underlying health condi condition can be pretty serious. Um, that's why we kept him home obviously. And since there's gonna be no remote option, I mean, he has to go back to school. So I'm very concerned at the idea that people will just be like business as usual in the schools. 53% um, are fully vaccinated as of the last I checked in Hampshire County. That is not, that is not reassuring to me. Um, that's fully vaccinated. I think it's around 62% have had at least one vaccine. Um, so, so, I mean, and I, I, I don't even think this is really a question about, you know, pro or not pro vaccine. I mean, I'll for sure get my son a vaccine as soon as they let me. Um, so my, my biggest concern is masks coming off and social distancing not being there and what that will mean for my son. I mean, there was cases when school was open last year. So that wasn't very reassuring to me. Um, the news down South is not reassuring to me. Younger kids are getting sicker. I mean, a five-year-old just died in Georgia. It's so all these things are really causing a lot of anxiety for me. And then to see the DESI um, protocol come out um, was a little unsettling. Um, I did see that Boston decided to keep masks in place regardless of the 
the Desi announcement. So that made me feel a little better. I'm hoping that will happen for Hadley as well. Um, and I'm sure I'm not alone. I'm sure I'm not the only one with a kid with a serious underlying health condition that that hopes that you will do this. Um, I think I've covered most of what I had to say. I did email um, Principal Dowd with these concerns um, before I realized that the meeting was today. Um, so it's definitely been on my mind. Um, so, and I know you guys are gonna be discussing this. I'll be very curious to hear what you guys have to say about it um, and what other parents have to say about it. Um, yeah, but I think that's all I have. Thank you, Sarah. We really appreciate your comments. Um, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so looking for additional hands, Carrie, I see you have your hand raised. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I prepared something. So I could start my talk with two facts, which in my mind alleviate the need to say anything further. They are good news facts. COVID-19 has a 98.7 survival rate for all ages. That rate is even better for children zero to 17. COVID-19 has more than one cure or treatment available to everyone at very low cost. CBD is in current studies. Ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are two drugs that have been used literally since the 1940s. They are proven to um, as a, a successful prophylactic and also as treatment for COVID-19. So good news there. But we live in strange times and those facts don't seem to be enough for folks. I characterize these times, unfortunately, as corrupt with extreme government censorship, scare tactics used by the media, outright lies, and an absence of critical thinking. Let's start with censorship. The recent JAMA pediatrics research letter published in June, which found alarmingly high levels of carbon dioxide in children's masks declared, quote, we suggest that decision makers weigh the hard evidence produced by these experimental measurements accordingly, which suggests that children should not be forced to wear masks, end quote. JAMA Pediatrics editor's notice of retraction came shortly thereafter, but was missing key points we should all consider to assess critically. Key point one, who raised scientific issues regarding the study's methodology? We don't know. It was that information is not provided to us. Key point two, no detailed evidence has been provided to support the concerns raised. Key point three, conflict of interest by the parties raising the concerns. We don't know any conflict of interest because we don't know who raised the concerns. Four, responses of the study's authors have not been provided. What we do know is that Facebook censored the original article when it was first published in JAMA Pediatrics. Quote, Facebook warns JAMA study on children's COVID masks false news sharers will be punished. That sounds pretty threatening. This is an example of extreme censorship and an outright attack on open debate, which has been going on for over a year. But there are plenty of other studies that give evidence of the uselessness of masks, the psychological effects and harm. I will name a few for the record. Title, Meta-Analysis from Emerging Infectious Diseases by the CDC, quote, we did not find evidence that surgical type face masks are effective in reducing laboratory confirmed influenza transmission, either when worn by the infected persons or by persons in the general community to reduce their susceptibility. Another title uh, study, Corona Children's Studies, first results of a Germany-wide registry on mouth and nose covering masks in children, quote, the effects of mask wearing for our children are measurable and have been for some time, but they have been ignored. One large scale survey of more than 25,000 children conducted in Germany found the overwhelming majority of children reported adverse effects from wearing face masks. Some of them were serious. The effects included excessive CO2 in the bloodstream, profound cognitive impairment, confusion, loss of consciousness, and asphyxiation. Another study titled, Is a Mask That Covers the Mouth and Nose Free from Undesirable Side Effects in Everyday Use and Free of Potential Hazards? I will put that in my testimony for your link there, and there's a hint, undesirable effects there are. Also noting psychological effects of putting our children in a constant state of fear, the Florida Citizens Alliance um, published a paper, which I will link to for your uh, resource. 
So what's on a face mask? A group of parents sent in their children's mask for analysis to the University of Florida's Mass Spectrometry Research and Education Center for Analysis. The report found that five of the masks were contaminated with bacteria, parasites, and fungi, including three uh, with dangerous pathogenic and pneumonia causing bacteria. Let me move now to media scare tactics and outright lies. Dr. Leanna Wen is a frequent guest on CNN. When, uh, when's 20, uh, May 25th, 2021 Washington Post column stated, however, some children have become seriously ill with more than 16,000 hospitalizations. So context matters here. 16,000 hospitalizations uh, sound like a lot. 4.1 million kids in 2019 had a visit to the emergency room per CDC data, which means that of those 4.1 million uh, children to emergency visits, 0.39, were due to COVID. Um, so let's be clear, that's less than 1%. But Dr. Wen isn't interested in offering a logical perspective. She's interested in scare tactics. Last month, she described COVID as one of the leading causes of death among children. Everyone in this meeting, and that is a quote, everyone in this meeting should be appalled and infuriated by that statement because it's an outright lie. The fatality rate per the CDC for children is 0.05. Children are more likely to die from car accidents, cancer, drowning, suffocation, than COVID. Has anyone this summer kept their kids from pools, beaches, or lakes? The Lancet put it famously last fall, quote, COVID-19 is generally a mild disease in children, including infants, excuse me. I'm gonna move on to critical thinking, which I believe is lacking, unfortunately, um, as and scare tactics seem to take over. Um, we all have a grasp of what critical thinking is. A key component, I believe, to critical thinking is understanding the world in which we are living and paying attention to how authorities arrive at decisions. With that in mind, I offer three examples. The Massachusetts Teachers Union is wielding too much power, money and political power, over decisions made and trampling on parents' rights. The CDC owns 56 vaccine patents and is essentially a vaccine business. And my lat, this last one is a personal favorite of mine. American Academy of Pediatrics is heavily funded by Pfizer, a fact that they just a few days ago removed from their website after they pushed for mask wearing for children this fall. Talk about a conflict of interest. We have never masked a population like this ever in human history. No one really knew what the outcomes would be in the beginning, but we have an understanding now the harm caused by masks ex exceed any protection that they might provide. I would encourage the school committee, and I thank you for your time, to weigh this evidence and in moving forward, not solely rely upon the CDC or DPH, its guidance that they offer to take into thoughtful and critical consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. Okay, um, we have Rachel Briggs. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Um, hi all, thank you for your time. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to speak tonight, but hearing this last speaker, I am moved to um, uh, uh, share my own concerns. Uh, and I wanna say that I am a supporter of the continued COVID protocols, uh, some of which, uh, I think Hadley has done an extraordinary job being a leader on this past year from what I've heard from the principal of Hadley Elementary. Um, I I'm sorry, hold on. Hi all, sorry. I obviously do not have a co-parent or childcare right now. <laughs> um, so I just wanna say that I am a continued support, I am a supporter of continuing all of the COVID protocols that Hadley has already um, instituted. So I am um, a, a proponent of masks, a proponent of continuing to do distancing as much as possible. I know Hadley is in a position in which um, they have small groups in large spaces, which is not true for many school districts. Um, I am a continued proponent. I'm a proponent of continued testing uh, and a proponent of contact tracing. Uh, in the light of Delta being, um, it seems to be, according to emerging evidence, twice as contagious as the previous COVID strain that we were dealing with last year. I think, um, I, I think that 
these times are, are as dangerous as they were last year. There is increasing evidence that Delta is causing outbreaks even in vaccinated populations as evidenced by the recent Provincetown outbreak in um, folks that were mostly vaccinated. Uh, the American Pediatric Association has recommended that we have um, everybody mask in schools. Uh, my pediatrician has recommended, so I, I took my daughter out of preschool and kept her at home with me because I was working from home uh, this past year, but my pediatrician, which my pediatrician uh, endorsed. And this year, my pediatrician has recommended that I send my daughter back to school, assuming that COVID precautions such as masks, distancing, and contact tracing are still in effect. If those things are not in effect, I will need to go back to my pediatrician and ask for her expert opinion about whether I can send my child to school safely. Uh, and finally, I wanna say that I am a staunch supporter of the MTA and the needs of the teachers. Uh, and, and when the teachers say that they need something or something is needed to be safe in the school, uh, I, I support them. Um, and so I, I wanted that on record that I say that as well. And I think the MTA has, done a good job fighting for the safety of both the teachers and our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Emily, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I'm really impressed uh, with our, our last speaker having not had any plans to speak tonight. Um, uh, she said everything I, I would have said, so I won't repeat all the points, but please add my voice to those sentiments. Um, the point that I would like to add now is that, um, you know, I haven't kept my, my child from lakes and swimming and adventures like that this summer, but, you know, when we're on a boat, we put on a life jacket. And, and when we're swimming, someone's watching children. You know, we take precautions is my point. So, um, that's what I support us doing here as well. I think that Hadley has done a really good job of keeping our kids safe so far. I, I was one of the more cautious ones and, and waited a, a very long time before sending my daughter back. And we were just really impressed. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the children for the most part were okay. I, I think that it's a direct result of really hard work from this group and the teachers and the administration. And I think um, a lot of hard work uh, to protect our kids as much as possible. I think the blankets for lunch were a stroke of genius. It's amazing. They create natural space and they let the kids eat outside. Um, so I'm, I'm here to say also, I, I hope that outdoor eating continues as much as possible. Um, I mean, e even in colder weather, they can put on a jacket. They have blankets already. It would just be nice to eat outside as much as possible. Outdoors, it's much, much harder to spread this thing. So I just wanted to add my voice to the last one. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, any other comments? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for contributing your voices to this important discussion. Um, clearly, we are not out of the woods um, and um, we look forward to the discussion a little bit later um, on the part of the school committee um, on this topic. Um, and Annie, are we good to move on to the next discussion, presentation and discussion? Yes, we items? are. Sure. And, um, I think I put in case anybody in the audience is having trouble accessing the agenda, it's the public and I did put it in the chat, there's a link there and within the agenda there are hyperlinks. So the next item on the agenda is um, just to remind the school committee that um, the commissioner of education published initial uh, fall guidance on Saturday, June 19th. And that's included as a link in the packet. It does say uh, for the fall at this time, again, this was published um, on Saturday, June 19th, all health and safety guidance, including masking and physical distancing will be lifted. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will collaborate with the Department of Public Health to issue, any, to issue any additional health and safety recommendations over the summer, should they become necessary. We are, um, we have an entire month before school starts. Uh, so, and I know when I say that, that some folks understandably think, oh, but that's just around the corner. Believe me, I understand that. I certainly feel that. And I know that many things can happen in uh, four weeks. So. 
the latest guidance is all I put in the packet. Um, and uh, I imagine we can expect additional guidance before the start of the school year. Thank you, Annie. It, it is a rapidly evolving situation, uh, as I understand it. Um, so I appreciate you staying on top of that and um, bringing that to our attention. Uh, committee colleagues, is there anything else you'd like to add about this? This is Heather. Nothing from me. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So to be clear here, Mary, we're just having a conversation now. And a little unclear. It's just trying to That's get exactly right. We're just it's a conversation to understand what the guidance is um, as it stands right now. And so Annie, so uh, as a previous speaker said that while the state has come out, Bessie has come out and said they're not requiring it from a state perspective. Individual towns, for example, Boston has come out and said we will require them for the fall. So Correct. It, have you seen any other towns or any other thinking about what? schools are going to do in the fall? I think that there are, I know of at least one superintendent, I don't want to name the town because I don't know that the superintendent has had the conversation with the school committee yet or uh, publicly yet, but I know at least one of my colleagues was discussing um, making some recommendations in advance of receiving guidance. That hasn't been what uh, is typically what we've done, but it doesn't mean that we couldn't do it going forward. So um, yeah, I will say that um, last year, the commissioner, and again, this could change, but last year, the commissioner uh, relied very heavily on the recommendations of the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics. If you recall, it was actually the American Academy of Pediatrics who strongly encouraged a return to in-person learning with um, mitigation measures. And he quoted them frequently uh, Desi did, and um, I, I don't want to say that DPH did. I can't recall exactly, um, but DPH and Desi worked together around guidance. So I would expect that we will see more from the state um, over the next couple of weeks, I would imagine. Thank you. I'm not in there as co-host, so I couldn't unmute. Oh, you couldn't? Um, no. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. I think that, you know, it, it's been a whirlwind of a year and a half for everybody, everybody in general. Um, and what I recall the most from our meetings over the time building up to the start of school and then throughout school is that every time we met, we had more information and maybe even a little bit more confusion or concern. And so I, you know, I think sitting tight and you know a couple of weeks from now we may have more information next week we may have more and it's just waiting and seeing what comes up as things seem to as humorous that keep changing rapidly so it'll be you know just waiting to see what happens and making the best decisions at at the time that we have that available thank you tara um, I noticed that we have a, a hand up. Any public comment um, has officially passed. What um, would you uh, advise? So public comment has officially passed. Um, you could certainly make an adjustment to the agenda and end it then after that, or um, you can request that the person um, submit their comments to the school committee via email. I'd prefer to do that. And I'd prefer to um, request that the um, person might come back to our next meeting uh, because this is going to be something that we um, discuss right up until um, school opens. So thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, so if there's no other comment from my colleagues, let's um, plan to revisit this again at our next meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is school start time planning next steps. Annie. There is a summary of where the subcommittee of, to revisit this topic of a later start, where that subcommittee ended up. I summarized the notes and actually put them directly into the agenda. So representatives from the HEA and the school committee met to discuss a later start for Hawkins Academy in 2021-22. The committee did recommend no change to the start time for this fall. 
the committee suggested that the district develop the plan for a later start during this year. So this isn't really about discussing should we, shouldn't we, but actually developing a plan in a manner that allows for a high level of public participation in transparent troubleshooting. And what that would probably look like is the same way that we developed the plans for our, our COVID protocols, right? So that was done on a space in Google where people could just watch in real time as they were developed and they could chime in on email and they could see. And that would also allow us to transparently kind of put out there, so what does it really mean? Like what would the bus schedules be? When is the first stop? When is the last stop? Um, how will this affect after school extra help sessions? What would the schedule be for that? Um, what are the opportunities? Would there be opportunities for supervision before school if families needed that? What will the bus seating arrangements and staffing on the buses look like? We have students from all grade levels riding the same bus. And to get an estimate, which we'll be able to monitor this year when there's dismissal for athletic events um, and how frequently that happens and how much time now, and if the schedule were to change, student uh, athletes would be, how frequently they would be dismissed from academic classes at the end of the day. could look like and um, uh, that felt very thoughtful and I was pleased with the outcome of, of that meeting. Um, colleagues, any other um, thoughts or comments on that? This sounds like a very prudent approach. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Same, thank you all that you and Ethan and Annie and the HEA for putting that time and thought into it. it sounds like a very logical approach. Thanks, Tara. And I'll just add one of the things we wanted to avoid is um, it almost would have been at most maybe three or four people writing plans this summer. And there was no way to um, you know, have that feel really inclusive. People ha are taking much needed and deserved summer vacations. We have a lot of teachers who are working. I wish they were working less. Um, so it was also just being mindful of the fact that uh, it would, if we move to do this in the fall, it may very well feel like Annie McKenzie's bright idea and solo plan. And that's unlikely to feel good for a lot of people. Yeah, really good point. That really resonated with me after the year that uh, year, year and a half that people had around uh, making plans, changing those plans, modifying those plans, and, and just working an incredible amount of hours through vacations to to get us through COVID, only to have uh, this uphill battle to have to respond to just in that short order, a month, two months before school began. This cycle just seemed really um, defeating <laughs> and. Um, taking a um, taking a, a longer view um, to really um, think through and anticipate uh, just felt um, right. Uh, Paul, any thoughts on your end? Okay. No, I agree. I think we need to. It's a big deal, and we got some really strong feedback, right, both from the students and the parents. So we need to really sit down and think about it talk to some more folks. And students will, um, I'll invite students to help with that 
writing, that public writing. Yeah, thanks. For that group. Great. Okay, thank you all. Um, next item on the agenda is capital requests. Um, we have a deadline for fall town meeting and a review of the most recent plan. Um, Annie. Yes, so I'm also going to invite uh, Chris to weigh in on the actual, because just this morning he did some shifts and changes to the 10 year capital budget and timeline. I'm gonna let him explain what those are. The decision the school committee needs to make tonight, this isn't the last and only bite at the apple to ever submit a capital request, but it sounds like from the memo that I also included in that email that you can link to, there, the town was not able to commit to capital requests during the FY22 budget cycle, um, but it, it could be that there may be money available for capital requests at special town meeting in October. That's a could be and a might. And so if the school committee had something that we felt as though we wanted to have on town meeting floor, uh, we would need to, I would need, Chris and I would need to let the town know by August 6th, um, so next week, I think sometime. Um, so now, uh, Chris, if you wanna talk about the changes you've made on the 10 year plan, and then the school committee can discuss um, at this time, do they want to submit a capital request at the October, for the October special town meeting? Sure, so the plan that we had originally attached to the agenda had some outdated items like the athletic fields, which uh, phase one is obviously finished on that. Um, and what we did was we just took out F, uh, FY21 <clears throat> and added year 10 to the end of it. Obviously, when you get out 10 years, things aren't really anywhere near etched in stone because God only knows what we're going to be looking at 10 years from now. Um, but I just pushed a couple of things out. Um, for example, in this current year, we had things like um, the locker room remodel and the Univent replacement, along with the tech upgrades all in one year. That's a lot. Uh, you know, it was almost 800,000 for the locker rooms, another 800 for the Univents, um, and then the tech upgrades at 50. So I just kind of moved things around a little bit, um, moving the locker rooms out one year. And then for the athletic fields phase two, I bumped those out a year as well. Um, really just to try to somewhat normalize uh, what we're looking at over the years. You know, you can see year one, we have 850, next year 930, 904 after that. Then it kind of drops off and it becomes a little more uneven because we're getting further out um, where we don't have any definite projects that need to get done. Um, but you know, this is this is really, I guess, what you might consider to be a draft at this point in time, just because you know this is the first you've seen it. So anything can be moved to really wherever you prefer it to be. Um, can you all refresh my memory about the Univents and um, what you know? I have to say, I don't. I don't own a Univent. I don't exactly know what it is. What is it used for? Why would we need it? Um, I know it's come up before. Uh, forgive me for not knowing wh why we would want one and whether it's absolutely necessary to do that this year. Um, the Univents are the heating units in the classroom. They're just called Univents. I have no idea why. Um, but um, so, it, you know, they're those big units that you see usually underneath the windows that blow the heat out. Um, and the majority of them are from either, I might have the year slightly off, but I'm thinking 1954 and 1965. So <clears throat> we've been, um, you know, repairing them with Band-Aids and duct tape for several years now. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I did have a presentation that we did to the town a couple of years ago when we first asked for this. And we had pictures of the insides of these units with, you know, things just unplugged because the parts no longer existed. And um, so we determined at that point in time, and we did consult with um, an engineering firm on this. And he agreed that getting parts is next to impossible at this point in time. And the proper thing to do was to um, 
you know, just replace the units. They've all well surpassed their expected lifespan. Um, and last year, because of COVID, we actually had companies go through and really super clean them. I mean, if you saw some of the before and after photos, you'd be amazed at the cleaning they did, which really did help them to function much better than they were before. I mean, things like taking the fans apart, and they're not a typical fan like you see, like a ceiling fan with, you know, several blades or something. They're, they're these cylindrical shaped things with probably 50 tiny little quarter inch blades on them. And what happened over time was that they really just got caked up with dirt to the point of where they weren't functioning very well. They went through all of those to increase the airflow in the classrooms last year, cleaned them out really, really well. Um, and so in my opinion, the Univents now are functioning much better than they were, say, last February. Um, that being said, you know, they're functioning well now, but again, repairing them is just something that isn't really going to be able to happen. So, you know, if not this year, sometime soon, we are going to need to replace them without a doubt. May I just tag on to that and then invite Paul, because I know that you, Paul, were a big part of everything that we did to prepare the buildings in terms of ventilation. So the, the question I want to assure the community, we did invest a considerable amount of time and money in making sure that um, they, the unit ventilators, that's what it stands for, a unit ventilator, that the unit ventilators were functioning and we had air um, exchanges tested in all spaces and all rooms. It is not a long-term solution. I think that's part of what Chris is saying here to invest that kind of time and money every single year would um, not make sense. But when I said inviting Paul to perhaps comment, I know the school committee has um, kind of a two day spread out retreat coming up. And one of the topics there is what is the vision for facilities? And so where does it make sense to invest now or are there bigger investments that we want to make? Um, so I don't, I don't know, Paul, if you wanted to follow up on anything regarding that as well. well yeah, thanks, Sandy. I think those are the other questions we have to ask. If it's $800,000 to replace a 60, 70 year old system that as Chris mentioned, we were brought it up to as, much, as highly functional as it can be. Um, and then there's also seven, $800,000 to upgrade the girl's locker room, which is, sorely needed from a, uh, just they need it and from an equality perspective, but I would argue um, that we want to keep investing into this building, right? There's a $300,000 more for the parking lot, which I, again is sorely needed. That's going to be needed no matter what the building looks like, but I guess that we need to take a step back and say before we keep putting millions into this building, do, is there another option? Is there some other way to actually start over with the new building? If you look at our previous submissions to the Massachusetts School Building uh, Administration. Is that it, MSBA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They- Building Authority. Not, yeah. Building Authority, thank you. And, mm -hmm. uh, we have not been successful in receiving grants from them, partly because, and this is a curse of our own due diligence, because we are uh, doing so well at keeping our uh, facilities up to speed. So they're not dilapidated, so therefore they uh, don't need to be replaced. And I understand they have a lot of uh, statewide competing interests, but I'm wondering if, if now's the time rather than say, let's put another million and a half into two things which are essential, but maybe we could do better. Let's look more to the future and potentially talk about how to get a whole new building. I understand that's a huge conversation, but um, so I, all that to say for the capital group, uh, capital expenditure group this week, Chris, I, I, I agree. I, I think we should really just make a small ask, if anything, in case there are some funds available, and I would focus on the tech resources, but not uh, focus on any of the other big expenditures like the girls' locker room, the unit events, the fields. Let's push those off for a year or two. That seems very prudent to me. Also, we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks then, um, just looking further out about building strategy um, and perhaps another um, you know, go at the Mass School Business Authority and seeing what we could do um, to put together a winning proposal. 
Great. So the revised version of this, then Chris would have that eight hundred thousand uh, dollar HA Univent replacement. Certainly not in the next year, but at least pushed out one year. Sure. Okay, I can do that. Yep. Can I ask a question? I know that it. You know, we've talked a lot about you know long term versus short term or whatnot, but the. The improvements that we've done thus far, just strictly looking at the Univents, is something, and I know Chris, it, you've learned what you learn, it's not your area of expertise to know the exact information about this, but you know, as far as the repairs that we've done, what is it reasonable to expect how long they would last? So like, this isn't something where if we don't act on it in the next year or two and we wait and explore options, um, that it's something that's going to become um, critical to need to address within the next school year. Do you have any idea? Yeah, we're not going to be without heat this uh, winter, are we? No. I can, I I can no, add no. something here because I know Chris, you also have, he's a wizard and it works in multiple districts, right? So I don't, never expect people to remember every detail of ours, but in our FY22 budget, part of what we did uh, and some of that grant funding set aside for was a commissioning contract with our HVAC company. So we continued also to have maintenance at the same level as we did starting last summer pre-COVID. Um, so it would be, even if something went awry, we have a contract where there's ongoing and routine maintenance at a level that we never had pre-COVID. So we have a separate commissioning contract. Chris, I truly do not expect you to remember that small detail in our FY22 budget or our other application. Great. Yeah, we certainly don't have to worry about not having heat, um, you know, <clears throat> mostly because of the work that we've already done. We had mm -hmm. heat to begin with, but a, a lot of my concern, quite honestly, you know, pre-COVID, um, you know, uh, <laughs> 18 months ago, none of us were really worried about air change over in a classroom and, and stuff like that. That wasn't even in our vocabulary, really. Um, but it was more just, you know, you're sending heat to these units and it's not getting blown out into the classrooms efficiently. Um, and so what it did really was it made our heating systems much more inefficient than they could be, which results, of course, in more oil being used and quite honestly, less temperature regulated classrooms, you know, it would get cold and the heat would kick on and get warm for a minute. And then it would get overly warm and the teachers would open the windows and, you know, it was that constant cycle. Um, and, and so going through these units, the way we did last year, really, you know, like I said, having them taken apart and the fans cleaned and everything, they are right now functioning significantly better than they were. Um, one of the things that COVID did really was it, it kind of, I guess, forced us to spend a considerable amount of money on the existing units that we wouldn't normally have done, you know. Um, I think what that probably does now is it, it certainly buys us a little bit of time. What that time is, is really hard to gauge just because of the age of the units. And, um, you know, basically, as you know, anything can go wrong at any time with, with these things. But, um, you know, we did have people go through them. So, by all means, there's no need to worry about not having heat in the classrooms. You know, if any of them break down, we will certainly just take care of it right away. I do think that's something to look forward when we look to, to the future is the inefficiency of the system we have. It's just really, the amount of oil that we use is not sustainable in the long term. Well, thank you um, to the entire team for just keeping our eyes uh, on this. Um, it sounds, it sounds like uh, we can make do for some period of time, but it's just not in our interest to keep throwing good money after, after bad. Um, so thank you. Um, let's, um, let's plan not to ask for the, this amount of money. We'll just ask for the minor technical brigades in terms of this next uh, capital um, proposal by the August um, deadline next week. Sure. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, next item on the agenda, legal opinion regarding accepting foreign exchange students and draft policy, Mackenzie. Yes, I have Mackenzie here and Tara, feel free to jump in at any point because we could just summarize this the discussion of policy subcommittee as well, even though I know later that comes up too. Um, but we did have an inquiry from a, a 
guardian who is connected with someone in our community and the guardian. So um, the person has been given uh, decision-making authority for a minor. Um, I believe the minor is the person's nephew uh, and the nephew is visiting from Ecuador. And so this guardian had a uh, temporary guardian had asked a question through one of our Hopkins Academy teachers of whether or not it would be an option for the nephew to attend Hopkins Academy for the year that um, the nephew's in the United States. I did ask the law offices, Dupre's law offices to provide a legal opinion for the school committee of if a student were to attend, what would that look like? And essentially the summary of that is there's really, um, there are a few different kinds of visas um, one is a J-1 visa. This family would not be applying for a J-1 visa because a J-1 visa means that a student is living, is going through a sponsor agency, like an, at, at a formal student exchange agency. Um, and the sponsor takes care of everything. Um, but rather, um, it is likely that the student would be applying for something called an F-1 visa. There are public school districts in the Commonwealth that accept students on F-1 visas, um, and they don't need to go through a formal exchange agency. In some cases, um, the F-1 visa students are required, their families are required to pay the cost um, associated with educating any child in the district. So the example that school committee's council provided was an assistant superintendent of another school district explained their exchange program in Massachusetts. And she explained that F-1 visa students pay the school the per capita cost of attending the school district. Um, that might either be the foundation budget rate or the actual uh, foundation pl budget plus the additional amount their community spends, if any. And then um, the family pays that. And the school uh, system is a essentially not incurring any cost. Uh, as the attorney pointed out, the school committee has the authority if they feel as though that the benefits that the community or students or staff would derive from having a student on an F-1 visa attend school um, exceed any costs or there aren't any demonstrable um, out-of-pocket costs associated with it, the school committee has the authority to not charge a student, you have that prerogative. But as the attorney said, um, should the school committee determine to do that, that they really should discuss it and vote on it. And Tara can weigh in here because let me be clear, I don't think the entire committee is ready to vote on this yet because questions came up during policy subcommittee, but that's a, some background and I'll turn it over to you, Tara. So we had a, a pretty good discussion and this took up um, this took up our, our whole meeting, kind of reviewing and, and picking through what um, the law office had sent um, as their letter of um, opinion and recommendation, um, as well as a draft um, policy for um, the school to um, include international students um, on a yearly basis. And so basically we kind of reviewed the recommendations and we reviewed the policies and we had a lot of unanswered questions um, and kind of how we summed up our meeting was, um, you know, kind of jotting down all the questions and looking for clarification that we had, but then really, um, I guess, asking to the rest of the school committee members um, as a general concept, as an overall, you know, arching concept of inviting international students um, into the school. Again, a lot of open-ended questions right now, but just the general concept, is this something that we're open to or not open to? Is this something that more questions should be asked to get these clarifications that Humera, Annie and I came up with or um, the school committee as a whole is just not, just not interested at all. And I think that's what we look to gain right now. Um, mostly, I guess, from you, Paul and Heather and unfortunately not Ethan tonight, um, but just to give you an idea, um, you know, the overarching concept of having international students um, be part of the Hadley community is something that Humera and I are interested in um, and are supportive of, but again, there's a lot of unanswered um, questions that we would need clarity before making a suggestion um, to the whole committee that we move forward with it. So that's what we're yeah, doing. This is for that. 
this is Heather and Tara, and I appreciate the framing. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, okay. Um, I'm supportive of pursuing um, this as an opportunity uh, with the caveat that you outlined in terms of getting clarity around the questions that we have, any open items. I recall um, a few years ago, Annie, I think you brought to us this um, uh, perspective, you know, kind of exchange program or hosting international students uh, at, when we were looking at um, kind of expanding, you know, trying, looking at the marketability of our school, for example. But I also liked seeing in the policy that this is not to um, uh, go outside of, say, school choice seats, right? Like we wouldn't open up a slot for somebody if there weren't a school choice seat available. So I appreciate that um, clarity, but I think it's a great opportunity with those caveats of getting things confirmed that we have questions on. And just to add to that is, uh, you know, you know, looking at how do we, um, for lack of a better word, regulate admission? Um, are there any stipulations or guidelines we should follow? And then financial implications is really, I think, the most of what we wanted to get a little bit more information on before we made a commitment. That makes sense. That yeah, makes sense to me. I'm very supportive. I, I think the, I don't know, you all had exchange students or foreign students in your uh, high schools, but I did, and so I still remember them. Right? So I think those are the exceptional opportunities uh, for both the incoming students and, and the class. Um, it seems like these are prudent questions, and, and I think we should definitely think through them. Uh, and so there was a, a mock-up of a resolution or so. Is that just trying to put together some ideas? One thing that the attorney did say is that um, if uh, if the school committee were to decide to proceed, that it's good to have a policy. So I said, can you share a policy from another district? And she, gotcha. this made me laugh. She said, well, I would, but they don't follow my advice and they don't have a policy. So she drafted up this policy as a starting point um, that if, we, if you go ahead with it, that there should be a policy around it. Okay. So just to be clear, there's still some outstanding questions. Annie has uh, uh, committed to sort of figuring out the answers to those questions and we'll bring it back for additional review. Great, thank you team. Okay, next on the agenda um, is acceptance of Staples donation, Annie. Yes, yeah, so a huge thank you, first of all, to Amy Jennings, one of our staff members who's uh, helping coordinate our summer programs right now and works during the school year now at Hopkins Academy in the athletics department. And she went out of her way to um, organize donations from Staples. So I'm pleased to announce that Staples was incredibly generous. Um, so they, they delivered um, many, 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 enough for every single student to start the school year with this really lovely pencil box, I'm gonna hold this up for you, but with markers and glue and um, just supplies that uh, individual students will have. And I thought this was particularly timely. I just saw something on the news about how parents can unfortunately expect um, kind of a run on that it'll be difficult to get school supplies um, in the upcoming school year. So the school committee always has to accept donations. I would like to say a big thank you to Amy Jennings for helping to coordinate this and a big thank you for a Hadley Business Staples for supporting our public schools. Wow, what a That's wonderful awesome. donation. Yeah, really so generous. Thank you so much um, to all who um, made this possible. Um, very, very kind. So um, we need to vote on this. Is that right, Annie? That's correct. Great. So um, do I hear a motion to accept the um, Staples donation? Yeah, so moved. And do I hear a second? Second. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, thanks for the generous. Terrific, thank you. Um, next up, we have disposition of assets, televisions and VCRs. Wow. People still use VCRs. 
Chris, that's all you. Are you there? You're the VCR person. Um, yes. Well, first of all, you can see I turned on my blurred video in the background now, so I match a couple of you on the screen. Um, yes, evidently no one uses VCRs, which is why we're just Did you find them, them behind the uh, Univents? Is that where they were? Or where the <laughs> yes. were? Maybe inside the Univents. That's I right. don't know. Um, so we had the old CRT screen TVs up on the walls and uh, VCRs connected to them. Those have been taken down. Uh, they're going to be replaced by either flat screens or um, larger screens that will have projectors on them. And uh, so basically at this point in time, we're just looking for the approval to dispose of the TVs. We can certainly offer them to other town departments. I honestly can't see them taking them because actually these TVs are, they're kind of a pain to get rid of. Um, we do have a recycling company lined up to pick them up if no one in the town wants them. Um, so, you know, we can certainly make sure that they're recycled appropriately. But, um, you know, before we offer them, we have to get your approval for them. Chris, a question, does any other town department want them or say Hadley Media? No, well, as I said, we'll offer them to the town departments before they're picked up. Um, and if anyone oh, wants it. them, okay. we, you know, we'll certainly give them to them. They can have them. Great. Yeah, I think um, making that offer available, Hadley Media is a great one. Um, I would also say, uh, I, I imagine that the libraries and senior centers probably have state of the art uh, things at, at this moment, but, uh, but maybe there are some other departments that can think of um, additional unique needs. Um, but thank you for, for doing that. And um, I would um, entertain a motion to dispose of the assets after checking in and making sure no one else wanted it. Yeah, so moved. Seconded. Terrific, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, great. Thanks for looking to recycle those, Chris. I know those can be a pain. Thank you. Great, next up we have summer retreat update. Annie. There we go. So I just wanted to remind uh, members of the school committee that we decided to break this out over two days. So please continue to keeping your calendars September 7th and uh, also September 16th. So Tuesday, September 7th and Thursday, September 16th. Right now, the list that I have, and I'll begin to put together an agenda, but I just, uh, if people think of things, I'll run down our list right now talking about our capital plan, uh, including doing kind of an inventory of our facilities, the age, the condition, any recent renovations, updates to our facilities, our thoughts on pursuing a um, request through Mass School, what we want to submit to Mass School Building Authority, uh, where we're looking for the CPA to support school projects in the upcoming year and beyond, uh, review of population data, and enrollment data and enrollment projections, um, discussion of our efforts and priorities around diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, um, family engagement, defining expectations, what specifically we hope to accomplish this year in terms of family, engaging our families, uh, review and update to the district strategy goals, review of school committee norms, a discussion of the budget for CARES funding three, that's the larger CARES funding that can be spent over multiple years. Um, later start time, although we pretty much talked about that tonight, but uh, it may be on the agenda. Uh, making school choice more accessible in order to draw from a broader range of communities. And um, perhaps the idea of, is there, do we wanna revisit the idea of generating revenue through the hosting of international students? Um, and of course, if people have other topics that they wanna address, and I'll make sure that in designing the agenda that things are clustered together in a logical way, right? Facilities, MSBA, CBA, capital, um, to try to just keep it organized for us. Great. On that, on that last one, I guess I hadn't picked up that you phrased it as, the idea of generating revenue through hosting. 
This is something that the school committee discussed, I think, Paul, prior to you being on it, because I think it was Roby, Linda, Heather, Humera, and I think it was Sean Mackin. But there had been a discussion about there was a school district in Franklin County that actually kind of ran its own, almost ran its own exchange program. Mm -hmm. And um, family students would, would pay money to participate in that. And it was revenue generating. The discussion tonight about that individual student, that really wasn't where, these are kind of two separate things. Okay, thank you. They're not, I mean, they could be linked sometime in the future, but let me make that clear. This is kind of just a larger discussion of, um, does it make sense to consider that and perhaps generate revenue that we might then look at how do we make um, drawing school choice students from communities where we get low participation more likely, right? So could you raise revenue in order to offset any costs associated with something else? That conversation. So connected to what we talked about tonight, but not it's separate from, that's not embedded in that policy. That's just about hosting international students in general. All right, thanks. Great, well, thank sounds you. Sounds like a pretty full agenda. It sounds great though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, reserving the time on your calendar team. Uh, we do have a lot to make our way through. Some of these things are interconnected uh, when we think about um, uh, what we wanna do with our school buildings, population decline, capital plan, uh, equity. Um, so it will be good to have a, a more thorough conversation and also um, a conversation that allows us to separate out and then and reflect um, and give some space and distance between times to really um, have a more thoughtful approach um, towards this. So uh, I appreciate that you are setting aside the time. Can you, can you remind me, Humera, or Annie, so the 7th and the 16th, what time? Yes. In both cases, let me pull this up for you. So I have from, I believe both are 5 to 9 p.m. is the time that we've reserved. And okay. it will be at Hadley Elementary School. And I, when I get the exact location, which room we're in, I'll let you know. And um, what I was gonna propose, this is a real tactical matter, but rather than, um, uh, you know, we can't, we can't spring for food out of our school budget, but rather than bringing the ordinary brown bag lunch, I was gonna suggest like ordering from a local venue like an Esalon, I'm happy to order it, uh, whatever you all want to get from the menu and then maybe you, we could Venmo one another. Of course, anyone can opt out and bring their brown bag lunch, but I think there's always something special to um, breaking bread together um, and having a meal um, separate. So if you're, if you uh, are game for that, I'm happy to organize that. And I, you said this, uh, Humara, but I'm just going to underscore it for folks who are listening, that the school committee is purchasing their own meals that night, and it is not coming from the school department budget. That is correct. I'd be happy to partake in that. Great. Thank you. Helen. Me too. Yeah. Awesome. Terrific. Okay, um, so that brings us to the business manager reports. Chris, are you still there? I am back again, still with the blurred screen. All right. Um, so let's see, we have three reports tonight and a little discussion really, I guess, with each one of them. Uh, first, you have the expense report. This one's a little bit different, um, quite honestly, because I was away last week and, um, just got back over the weekend. So I ran these reports today. And when I fed them into the normal report that you have, it's in an access database, but we've moved some funds into some new accounts and those accounts are not in the database yet. So when I took this report and exported it into access to kind of get sorted into the report that you guys normally get, it was missing about $100,000 or so of expenses. And it takes probably a couple of hours to add all those accounts into it. I just didn't have the time today to do it. So what you have here is, is the full report of basically each account um, that we have. It's a, it's a rather ugly report too, I have to say. Um, it's, it's difficult to read, um, but that's, that's what comes out of the general ledger. So I will be sure to get those added for the next report and, uh, and you'll be back to the much easier to read format. Um, but what this report does show is that 
at the end of the year, which by now is, uh, as far as I'm aware, complete, um, unless we get some unforeseen surprise thrown at us. Um, we have $335,000 and change, uh, you know, $452 uh, remaining in the budget. Now we're supposed to give 375 back to the town. Um, and you might wonder how are we going to reach that? Well, we also had a check coming from Granby because we share an employee with them. And unfortunately we missed submitting the bill by a couple of hours um, to when they had their warrant run. Um, I did ask them, can you please make sure we receive this by June 30th? We got it on July 2nd. Um, so what that means is that the town gets the money. Um, so I did contact the town and just, you know, say to them, hey, listen, we were supposed to have this to offset the salary we paid. Um, and the, the check is for $50,189. So basically what that does is it puts us at $385,641 and change. Um, so it's actually 10,000 more than the town was expecting to get. And they they were fine with that. They said, no problem at all. We'll, we'll basically keep the check and add that to the amount that you're giving back to us. Um, and, you know, we're fine with that. And they actually, you know, thanked us for our generosity and uh, giving back to the town. So I just wanted you to be aware, um, you know, if we had received it before June 30th, you would have just seen it in this total because it would have offset the expense that we had. Um, and so that's that's essentially it. I mean, this is uh, this is an unusual year. I wouldn't expect too many more of these, but um, you know, we had some opportunities for savings and some significant amounts of funds coming in for COVID, and that enabled us to be able to commit to give back this money to the town, and we were able to do it. So, certainly a good thing there. Does anyone have any questions on the ugly expense report? No. So in the okay. end, we ended up giving uh, back to the town about three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. Yes, three hundred eighty-five thousand six hundred forty-one dollars and fifteen cents. So, excellent. Thanks, Chris. That's, that's terrific. I'm sure they will appreciate it, especially this year. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Any other questions for Chris? Nope. Okay. Then we have the grant report. Um, as you can see. The majority of the grants are fully spent. Um, the 113 ESSER, there's about $4,500 remaining. We have next year to spend that money as well. So we're just carrying it into next year. Um, Circuit Breaker has uh, almost $93,000 remaining. We're allowed to carry over a little over 95,000. So we're in good shape there. We, uh, you know, we kept it under the amount we can carry over. And the 274 SPED Improvement Grant will be spent this summer. Um, we have until August 31st to spend that money, and that will be all spent um, by that point in time. Everything else, as you can see, was fully spent down to the penny. So um, it's a rule. We do not give back the funds once we get them, and we made sure that we spent them all. So um, and I don't remind me, has Chris, any questions. Yeah, where's the, that third round of um, federal COVID funds? Yeah, so we um, they're not on this report yet because they start in FY22. Um, oh, so we didn't okay. touch them yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you'll see those once I once I prepare this report for FY22. We'll have some of these grants the same. Some are slightly different. Um, but as you can see, this this report used to be a much shorter report. Um, but the grants keep getting added on. So um, yeah, I'll I'll be sure to add those on. Um, even even before any funds are spent, just so you can at least see the amounts that we have available to us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions for Chris? I wrote another one today, Chris, so just an FYI. Wonderful. <laughs> I was thinking, Andy, so which ones have, uh, have we garnered through our application? Early college, innovation pathways, yeah, so I would imagine that next year there'll be additional funding to continue to support those programs, but those uh, RFPs haven't been issued yet. This summer, we received funding for summer enhancement grants, which was where I was able to ask families, would you be interested in any of these activities? We've had a number of children sign up for a wide range of activities um, from creative writing clubs, book clubs, 
uh, doing some work to help our media specialists weed the stacks, learning Urdu, a wide range of things that students and ELL summer camp, all of that was uh, grant funded this summer. Um, we received some grant funding also to offset some of the costs of our regular extended school year program, which will um, allow us to reallocate those funds as we need um, in the regular school year and we received grant funding this summer for acceleration academies and also some early college funding this summer and um, the grant that we're working on right now with UMass would be to establish another pathway program, a future educators pathway program that would work similar to early college. Um, students would be able to, who are interested in teaching and we have a, a, a surprising amount of, I shouldn't say surprising like that, it's great thing, of students after this year. I'm sure some of the teachers are like, really, they wanna be teachers? Um, so a surprising amount of students in, at Hopkins who are always interested in getting field exp experiences in the classroom and set up their own independent studies. So working with UMass, we're trying to make this a pathway, uh, create courses that they could earn, uh, credit bearing college courses they could take if they were interested in becoming an educator. And we would really, it's part of diversification. So we'd really try to target students who are, or people who are underrepresented in the teaching profession and try to encourage them um, to consider it. So it's, it's pretty exciting what we're putting together right now. And it'll be great to have um, yet another pathway for students at Hopkins. And then the grants in the fall will remain to be seen what we'll be applying for. Those were just the summer grants. Annie, you are an incredible, um, prolific grant writer. I remember when this sheet had about half the number of line items. I suspect that next year we might have to double to a two page grant uh, list or, or go to like 10 point type, perhaps nine point type. Thank you for that. Um, so revolving funds. Okay, so here's another report that uh, there'll be a little bit of explanation involved with it. Um, if you look at the athletic fund, again, really not much happened all year, certainly not in the last few months. Um, the lunch account is where you'll see a large swing. Um, and, and the reason for that, it's, it's actually twofold. Number one is that, as you can see, even though we had the free lunch program all year, which meant that we were making more money than we normally would if we were charging for lunches, we still lost $48,000 this year. Um, and we've been losing money really every year since, probably since I got here. Um, I hope that's not a timing issue where as soon as Chris came, it couldn't make any money. But, um, and so what we've been doing year after year is actually taking some of those expenses and, and charging them to the local budget just to kind of keep the balance up. You know, so we had actually something, I mean, there were some years where we started with a few thousand dollars in the account. Um, so what we did this year, number one, is we transferred uh, a considerable amount of expenses from the lunch account into the local budget. Um, another aspect of the balance is we actually got our June payment of $16,000. We typically get that in July, but for some reason, the payments came early this year. So it's actually reflected in the balance. Um, so you're seeing kind of a double revenue. We actually got $37,000 in June instead of you know, normally we get about 19. So, um, you know, a little bit of a bump up there. Um, the preschool account had a similar situation. As you remember, I did say that it was losing money and um, we were gonna have to boost that up. Um, again, if you look at where we started the year in the preschool account, $40,000, that's a pretty low balance. That's significantly lower than we usually start with. Um, and that is due really to the last three months of last year where we paid everyone's salaries, but we had no revenues coming in. And so the account took a pretty good size hit there. Um, and so what we did was again, um, some teaching and para salaries got moved to the regular budget to get that account balance to back up where it was a little more healthy um, and set us up going forward to be in much better shape than, you know, I mean, it was negative 65,000 a month ago and you know, even if we brought it to zero, we'd find ourselves in a, in a little situation again next year. So by giving it some additional funding, we're able to, you know, just be sitting in much better shape going forward. Um, student activity, you know, that's, that's just your typical um, account changes, really, you know, as, as things go up or down. It, 
not a heck of a lot of difference really from where we started the year. Um, same with Hadley kids. We've had some salary expenses, not a lot, and uh, some phone expenses. And that was basically it for Hadley kids. Um, school choice. Again, this is an account where we had budgeted a certain amount to use, but with the amount of COVID funds that we had gotten in this year that we were able to offset some expenses with um, and just other savings that we were able to achieve, you can see we're sitting um, in a much better spot with school choice than really than we expected to. Um, if you look at that balance that we're showing there and we we budgeted, I, I'm, was it 875 and that we budgeted for next year? Uh, 892, 975. Oh, okay. 892, 975 is budgeted to be school choice funds to be applied to FY22. Okay. So, you know, that, that leaves us with about just, just call it $400,000 rounding. Um, and we expect to get about 640,000 maybe in, um, next year. So that's going to put us over a million dollars, a little over a million dollars. Um, and the policy calls for us to have the equivalent of the federal grants received, um, which no, is about, I, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to think of what that is. So the, the, it's tricky this year because of, because of ESSER. Hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if it were a normal year, that's all those CARES funding. If say a normal year, your reserve is roughly, um, call it around, just under half a million, maybe, you know. Right. And um, but it's it's a little off with ESSER. Yeah. So what we what we have is a surplus, really, a a, a little under two hundred thousand dollars over what our policy calls for us to have at this point in time. So, you know, that can be used for any number of uh, projects that you might want to apply them to. Um, uh, kind of a for lack of a better term, just a rainy day account to have you know the funds in in case we need it. Um, it, it can be used for really anything that you determine. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware that you know that's that's a higher balance than we typically have. Um, that, that's you know I, I wouldn't expect that kind of savings going forward, but it was nice to be able to have them this year anyway. Great. So if those unit events go, for instance, we could we could do something about that. <laughs> We don't, we don't expect them to, but if they did, we, we, we right. I mean, our rainy day fund. Yeah. That, that's why it is always good to have that money, you know, just as a, just in case scenario. I mean, you, you know, you don't want it to grow to, you know, four or $5 million or anything like that, nor do we expect it ever to. Um, but you know, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of surplus there just in case, certainly. Right. Great. And uh, just school choice is a little bit of an unknown next year. Just know that. I mean, we'll know what will happen is we'll know what our enrollments are at the beginning of the year. But um, people will probably, we just don't know what's going to happen over the next month. And we're certainly hoping that um, things kind of settled to where they were pre-COVID. Um, but that remains to be seen. When will we know, Annie, uh, roughly, you know, be a little bit clearer about what school choice will look like? Well, we have, uh, and I, I couldn't tell you if you asked me the applications to date. Um, I just have a feeling, that's a great scientific way to start a sentence, I have a feeling, <laughs> but I have a feeling that people will be making decisions in August. I think people are really going to be looking at what school districts do and what the fall looks like. So I, I really feel like we won't have a pretty clear picture until we're, we're sitting in the first week of school. Okay. Great, thank you. And um, similarly, um, this year we're we're gonna actually have a Hadley Kids program and a preschool program. What is the schedule for when we get an update on how that's going, what enrollment looks like, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, um, I can tell you uh, if I can tell you at the end of your school committee reports. I just have to look something up. This is one upside to virtual, right? Um, I can look something up here and find, I, I can give you some information right now of how many applications we have and, and other information. Okay, great. All right, does anyone else have questions? Chris, can you tell me again? So I'm sorry, the lunch and the preschool swung about 130, $140,000 yeah. in a month. How did the 
where did all that money come from? I know you said we got some bolus of money for lunch, but where did the rest of that money come from? Yeah, so typically what we would do with the lunch account is in June, we would bring the balance back up by transferring salary expenses from the lunch account to the regular budget. Oh, that's it. Okay. So that's what we did this year. And the same with the preschool. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Nope. I can tell you you're Hadley kids now. Perfect timing, Chris. Uh, Sarah Frost wrote to me on Thursday, July 22nd. We currently have 40 fully registered students, 13 pending registrations. Parents that have requested packets but have not yet uh, submitted those packets. Um, and she has been actively interviewing uh, staff. She had 10 applications at that time uh, with potentially two more. Um, and so she started uh, interviewing this week um, and she anticipates, so I would anticipate at in early August that we would have kind of our staffing laid out and everything else that I could then bring to the school committee. Great, thank you. Okay. I just also wanted to mention, if I could, that uh, my apologies to Tara for filling her email box with, with um, a boatload of warrants for her to sign, only to get a response from her that she's no longer the signer. Um, and <laughs> so now I'm, I'm after the meeting, I'm going to go into right signature and see if I can switch it to Ethan to uh, get them over to him. Uh, I'm hoping I can do that. If not, even though Ann shot it right back at me, filling my mailbox with 21 instances that she signed the warrant, she may have to do it all over again if I have to re-upload them. So um, I apologize. What? I apologize for that, but um, I will get it straightened out tonight. I forgot all about the change. I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Does that, yeah, that's totally okay. Does that mean that we'll um, be um, voting on the approval of the warrants later today, or does that mean that we hold on that? Um, I, I believe you can still vote to approve them. Um, I know on my school committee, we'll vote in a meeting and then we can sign them afterwards. It's the vote actually that's more important. Um, so I think we're okay with that. Great. And if you need me to do something, Chris, it's, so, it's okay. Just next time we'll change it to Ethan if you can't. Yeah, no, no problem at all. I, I'll figure it out one way or the other. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you. All right, school committee reports and discussion. First up, we have CES, Heather. I have no update since the last time we met, um, although I will be attending their meeting coming up. And so I sure do hope to fulfill a report on this next time. Great, I'm curious about how their new executive director is working out. So look forward to that report, thanks. And um, finance. Uh, that's Ethan, but I wonder if anyone else has any information about that. I know that Ethan did attend the finance meeting. I don't think that there was anything that um, major. And so I think that he can update the committee when he's at the meeting in August. Terrific. And policy, um, Tara. Um, so the only thing that we have in here is the um, first reading of that policy JFBC, that's the preferred vocational school. Um, and I can't remember if it was the last meeting or the time before that, um, we had reviewed it, we received some feedback. Um, this is an updated draft that has, a, I think, addressed that feedback um, that was brought forward to bring a little bit more clarity about the application process. Um, so this does not need a vote today. It's just the first reading. It'll be back again at the next meeting for a vote. So if there's anything glaring that anybody wants to bring up to us that we need to address. And just to um, recap, the question was, um, do students just need to apply to Smith Book um, and just have it be performative? Or if they get in, they have to attend Smith Book. And in fact, the new policy reads, yes, they have to apply. If they get in, they have to go there instead of uh, wherever it is they want to go. So take a look and we will discuss it again in the next meeting. And finally, fields and capital. Paul. Fields, I know they're trying to uh, finalize the phase one, the contract that was a punch list for all the remaining aspects. I'm not sure, Chris or Annie, if you know if that's been fully completed. Um, Chris, do you know? I'm sorry, I do not. 
Actually, um, no, I don't either. I saw the emails and um, I never it was saw one a couple up. of weeks ago and maybe one last week too. Right. Um, to be quite honest, I didn't spend a lot of time emailing while I was away. Um, so I was kind of just waiting to see if, um, if Carlos would kind of respond and say it was all done. I don't think it is fully completed yet. Um, otherwise, I assume he would have told us, but I can reach out to him and ask. Okay. And then uh, the only other thing is, and I'm, I'm delinquent on this, is reaching out to CPA to give them an update since we are uh, closing and not finished. But they don't, I don't see any of the meetings of theirs posted. I don't think they have any. Or maybe they do now, but it's, it's been a while. I can look for it. I don't know if any off the top of my head. I didn't see I any up on the, the Tom website. I could, call, I could contact Carolyn and see. If, yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Other than that, no updates. I have a quick question about fields, um, and that is, are there any things, uh, any items that need to be done to the fields before school reopens that would be best to accomplish in this last month that we have? Or are, are those kinds of things already done? This should be done. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, it's all just sort of patch repair, little things. Yeah, it's a good question, but no, I don't think there's anything big. Terrific. Okay, thank you for that. And um, so we're now at announcements. Um, do my colleagues on the school committee um, or any of the other administrators have any announcements for us? None from me. Okay, I, I have one quick announcement and that is that um, we, um, the schools, Hadley Learns, the Friends of the Senior Center, and uh, the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion are hosting an event on August 5th at the Senior Center. August 5th is a, is a Thursday, and um, it uh, starts at, it goes from 5 to 8 p.m. It's called First uh, Ever um, Hadley World's Fair. And it's designed to be a, a, a cross-cultural event um, with uh, potluck and food. Um, you can check that out at uh, Bitly Hadley World Fair. I wrote this, I'm not sure if my screen is going to really be, uh, no, I don't think you'll be able to see. Oh, here we go. Hadley, Bitly Hadley World Fair, all one word, lowercase. Yeah, I don't think it's really working. Um, so Hadley World Fair, um, check it out. I'm making chana masala with basmati rice. There's plenty for everyone. Um, there's um, uh, Kayla Orlin and Wayne, um, her husband, they're bringing rugula. Um, we've got folks making um, uh, German apple cake. Um, so think about where your roots are from and bring a dish for share. It should be a really good uh, opportunity to mingle, bring out students, a real intergenerational opportunity, seniors and young people alike. Um, so we'd love to see you there. Sounds great, thanks. All right, and so action items. Um, we, let's see, action item A, accepting students on J1 and or F1 visas, we're holding on that for now. Approval of minutes, um, June 28th, 2021. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve the June 28, 2021 minutes. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific, thank you. Um, approval of AP warrants for June, 2021. I believe there are three of us that can vote on this. Um, do I hear a motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. And um, and I Heather will abstain. Uh, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. Uh, Aye. Okay, terrific. And then lastly, approval of warrants for June 2021. And um, here two, three of us will vote. So do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve the warrants for June 2021 that Chris just sent the whole email of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Do I hear a second? And this is the one that Paul will abstain from. Um, and so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Terrific. Um, so our next meeting date is August 30th at 5.30 p.m. 
We will continue to meet on Zoom. Do we? And we do have a policy subcommittee meeting the half hour before that. Um, I and think important for people to notice in their calendars that's the last Monday. It's not the fourth Monday. Last Monday, August thirtieth of the month. That's right. The last Monday of the month. Um, also, a good reminder is that the calendar invite contains the most recent agenda. So take a look at your calendar invite for that link. Um, we are not convening um, in executive session, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. And a second? Second. Seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, terrific everyone. That's exactly an hour and a half. Thanks. Nice. Have yes. a good night.